Hello, and welcome to the SCAD Savannah Film Festival. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm David Canfield, Movies Editor at Entertainment Weekly, and I'm here today to moderate our Breaking Big panel and awards. And we're joined by six very deserving recipients. I will introduce them and they can briefly hold up their award. We have Ciara Bravo, star of the upcoming Cherry. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Claire Dunn of herself, writer and star in this case. <laughs> Joshua Caleb Johnson of The Good Lord Bird on Showtime. Elle Lorraine of Bad Hair on Hulu right now. Joe Allen Pellman of the upcoming The Prom, which will be on Netflix. And Talia Ryder of Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, which came out earlier this year and is now available for streaming as well. Well, hello everybody. Congratulations to you all. I've seen, all you. your, I've seen all your projects, um, in most cases, multiple times, and uh, all of your work is moving and funny and different and weird, and it's just very exciting to have you all here. Um, wanted to start by asking about the very nature of what these awards are, which are honoring breakout performances and up-and-coming uh, talent in this very strange time. <laughs> Um, what has it been like to sort of have this moment for yourself uh, amid such uncertainty? And I'm curious what what work has been like for you, you know, whether you've been going on Zoom auditions or go doing some COVID safe shooting. Um, how has it been in the sort of post glow of getting this breakout role? I'll start with you, Joellen. Sure. Um, so we actually, we, um, we're so fortunate to be able to finish filming during COVID. So back in March, um, we shut down production with only three days to go. And we were able to finish filming safely at the end of the July. But um, right after we halted production in March, I moved back home to Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and I've literally been there ever since. Um, I'm here right now. And I don't have any plans to leave. I've been enjoying um, all of my extra time you know, with my family. And I'm so grateful that my family has been able to stay healthy in all of this. And I, it's been a welcome change to just step back and to realize that we are all sort of in the same boat where we all don't really know what's going to happen next. Like we cannot predict what the next year is going to look like. And so it was nice to just be able to be present and be with family and not have to worry so much about, oh, you know, what's my next move gonna be? What's my next, you know, you know, project? What's what's next? It was just about living in the here and now. So I'm very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Elle, what about you? Your film, uh, newly on Hulu, and of course, way back in January, uh, you got to go to an in-person festival along with a few others uh, at Sunday. Yeah. That's where the film premiered. Um, first off, Thank you guys for this. This is such an amazing experience and honor. So I'm so grateful to be here and to receive this. Um, but first off, Sundance was incredible and I cherish it even more now, like knowing that that was one of the last moments I had out in the world and a really truly epic moment I got to experience with my film. Um, but it's been wonderful experiencing it this way. You know, we're in trying times, so it's really nice to have something to look forward to. <laughs> and everyone's been so amazing with adjusting to the new world we live in. So I've been doing promos this way and press this way. I have done COVID safe photo shoots. I've been doing a lot of those and that's been nice just to get out into bonding to create. I'm such an artist. So I need that kind of artistic time to, like just dive into myself and then I get to go away and come back into my own space and be really focused and you know uh, speak up for what's going on right now so that's been really wonderful and I create as well so my creative partner and I have been writing and pitching and that's been lovely. Nice. Um, well all of you are here for work that I think speaks to um, both past and contemporary issues uh, in pretty, um, at times, intense ways, sometimes a little funnier. Um, Claire, you are also the writer of herself, and I'm curious for you, having this sort of moment in a film that deals with particularly domestic violence in a pretty visceral way, um, what has this been like for you, not only to, to be a part of a project like this, but now to be talking about it and, and um, you know, experiencing it with other people. Yeah, well, I was 
um, a bit similar to Al there. I was in Sundance um, myself, and that was kind of where I first ever saw my movie with an audience. And I felt very incredibly honored, actually. I realized that, like, sometimes as a writer and as actors, we don't know what people will connect to. And it takes seeing it in front of an audience or seeing the reaction of an audience to help you learn what you were creating. And I realized that like it's a it's certainly a universal problem, and also the the whole um, issue of housing crises and um, how we build homes for ourselves, and in the Western world, how much we overpriced everything and inflated everything when food and shelter should be basics that everyone has a human right to. And I think a lot of people connected to that, and it didn't need, it didn't matter that it was only set in Dublin, basically. And I really, I felt very grateful for that. And throughout the coronavirus and pandemic, um, our awareness of domestic violence has actually been heightened because uh, all of us have had to stay home. So for some people, unfortunately, home isn't a great place, but um, the awareness about the issue now is higher, which is possibly a positive. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. Talia, what about for you? Uh, never really, sometimes always, hit theaters just as the pandemic started to swirl. Um, but it also premiered at Sundance to, to a lot of critical acclaim. And this movie deals um, very sensitively, very realistically with uh, teen pregnancy and um, particularly in towns that are more restrictive, um, have more restrictive access to abortion uh, and care in that sense. Um, what, ha what was the experience like for you to just be a part of that story? Um, and, and now again, to be talking about these issues? Yeah, I mean, it was a really big honor to be a part of a project like that. When I first read the script, I was immediately taken by Eliza Hitman, who was our writer and director. Her approach to the topic and her, her just honest depiction of what getting an abortion can look like in some areas of our country. And it was, it was really great getting to go to Sundance and go to Berlin before the world closed down because it seeing the reaction of women in the audience and all people who have dealt with the issue or have felt not heard or represented by their government, just getting to see that response in person and also on social media, I've gotten a lot of really nice messages. It, it, was, it was really great and made me really happy to be a part of the project. Hmm. You have um, sort of a, a dynamic screen partner with Sydney, uh, and a lot of mm -hmm. you actually have these sort of duets. Uh, Joshua, you of course are working with a pretty wild <laughs> Ethan Hawke and the Good Lord Bird. Um, what for you as a young actor have you have you learned from working with somebody like that, and also just from having that kind of that partner um, on screen? Yeah, I learned a lot from Ethan. I mean. Most of my scenes are with him, as you said, he's my scene partner, essentially. And, you know, I was with him for roughly like five or six months. And I learned so much, you know, him teaching me about what it is to be a young actor. And, you know, him always telling me that I have to be open to change and, you know, open to listen because there's always something new that I can learn every single day um, coming to set. And so I'd say I learned a ton from him. Hmm. Ciara you have a much more intense, I would say, <laughs> duet in many ways with Tom Holland, that cherry comes out uh, next year. So we probably have to be a little more tight lipped about it. But, you know, this film deals very uh, intensely with addiction. It's based on a novel that um, really confronted this topic uh, and its current role in American life pretty vividly. Going into the sort of these intense places with Tom, um, what was that experience like? You know, I feel so weird saying it was a great experience because we are handling a topic like, you know, the opioid epidemic, and that's such a, a harrowing experience for everyone who is involved, whether it be personal or, or family related. But mm -hmm. honestly, I could not have asked for a better partner in all of this. Tom was so spectacular and, and working with the Russo brothers, I feel like we were able to ha um, handle this topic with just an extra layer of sensitivity and, and hopefully honesty. Mm -hmm. Coming away from a project like this where, um, you know, it is very illuminating, it will be very illuminating for a lot of people who see it about just what a lot of people in this country are going through every day. 
how did it how did you come away from that experience thinking about the kinds of projects you want to do going forward and and the kind of actor you want to be that's a very good question <laughs> um <laughs> you know leaving a project like cherry i was exhausted and invigorated at the same time because you know being able to tell the story of people that don't often get to speak or often aren't listened to is always it's always an extremely you know humbling experience and and, and to be able to do that for the rest of my career would really be an honor i think that's what really makes this industry so special is being able to sit down in the theater or on your couch and look up on screen and hear somebody say, I hear you, I see you, you're not the only one. Mm. You can do it in such a beautiful way. Mm. Elle, what about for you coming off of such a tonally wild movie like Bad Hair, particularly working with a director like Justin Simeon, who I think has such a specific voice um, that has become so um, really beloved in, in American cinema. Um, I mean, I felt honored, like working with Justin, not only with his script and not only with him as a director, but with him as a partner. It was such, um, it was such an experience for me to grow and for me to understand the, the whole ask, like the whole process of making a film in this way even deeper. Um, but like I got to work with Vanessa Williams and Blair Underwood and Usher and Kelly. So literally every day I was in shock because I'm working with icons of this industry, but also black icons who I've watched growing up. So they've influenced how I move through the world just as a human because so many of them came to set open and willing to work and play and just to trust Justin and do what he asked of us. And it's incredible that we've gotten to be a part of a movie that says something right now about what's going on in our world, even though it's set in a different time. And it uses horror as its entryway into those topics of conversation. Mm. Speaking of icons, Joellen, <laughs> you have quite a few that you work with uh, in the prom. Um, I imagine you must have arrived pretty star, star sorry eyed. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, every single person in that cast is someone who I've looked up to like my entire life. I mean, like Ryan Murphy, our director is, I mean, he's a visionary and I was such a gleek. And so it was a dream come true to work with him. And I mean, he just, he knew exactly Exactly what he was looking for in a performance and he allows the actors the freedom to find your own path to it. Um, I just felt so safe with him and I also he's hilarious <laughs> and then I mean the, the whole cast it was like every day on set was truly the best day of my life. I think um, Meryl, I learned from Meryl uh, when she said you know you your job as an actor is like to take the work so seriously, but to never take yourself seriously for a second. And that was the prom for me. I mean, we had so much fun. I have never laughed so hard as I did in all of our group numbers and our big dance scenes. And it's something that I'm going to hold, you know, dear in my heart for the rest of my life. Hmm. What were filming those, those big numbers like? What lessons did you take away? Because I imagine there's just a lot of expertise you're working with too. Oh my gosh, yes. And I think like the biggest thing I learned is, you know, you go full out on every single take and you give your scene partners and you give your dance ensemble, you give your background actors the same level of energy that they're giving you. And it can be such a supportive environment. I remember um, on the, so the final, the final number we shot over, I believe it was three days of filming. Um, and by the end, I mean, we were working long days, everyone was tired, but when we finally, um, when we finally wrapped on the last day, everyone, like the dance ensemble, background actors, like um, uh, principal cast, like we all didn't wanna leave and someone started playing We Are The Champions over the sound speaker. And there's videos of all of us just like standing and singing and hugging. <laughs> It was like the, you know, high school sports team just won the state championship, that right. level of energy and excitement and just knowing that what we just created is going to bring a lot of joy and meaning to people all over the world. Hmm. Um, the Prom is, of course, based on a Broadway musical, and we mentioned Cherry being based on a novel as well. Uh, Joshua, the good Lord Bird, 
being based on a really beloved novel, an award-winning novel, um, you know, there's, I imagine, a certain pressure to kind of do right by it. Um, what was what was that part like for you to work off of such um, revered existing material? Um, it wasn't actually too hard because you know the writers like for the show were in very close contact with James, um, the novel uh, James McBride, the author yeah. of the novel. And I mean, if you read the novel and kind of and you see the show, it's basically identical. There's yeah, not really much similar. That we we didn't really take out much and. Basically, I would say about 85% of it is what was in the novel. And so it was just pretty easy to work on a set that, you know, I, we had such, you know, big support from the author himself. Mm. Um, well, I wanted to bring this one to all of you, which is, um, when did you know, first know you wanted to be an actor? And, and what did the earliest days of that journey like for you? I'll start with you, Claire. Oh, and... Um at first, it was just my mom asking me what I what I liked doing when I was in school, and I used to tell her that I liked telling stories and making my friends laugh. So she sent me to a little drama class. So that was when I was about twelve, but I didn't know that was a thing you could do for real. <laughs> and then it was only yeah when I left secondary school, uh, the year version of high school, and um, I got into a drama college, and I thought okay, I'm going to try and do this for real, but if I don't get a job in it within a year, I'm not sticking with it. I was very practical-minded, and I was always a bit suspicious of it. <laughs> but people kept people kept willing me to stay in it, like, you know, teachers and stuff, whereas originally I probably was thinking I would uh, either teach or direct or just do something very, uh, in my head, more dependable. But luckily, I've, I've managed to... Squeeze through the cracks. <laughs> <laughs> you are here after all. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Talia? Um, I was a dancer in, when I was younger. That's really all I wanted to do, which I guess was for the same reason that I want to act, just because I liked storytelling and I thought dance was the way I could do that. Um, when I was younger, my mom and my grandma took me and my younger sister to see Matilda on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And after seeing that show and seeing, because there were kids in the show, kids my age, dance and sing and act, I fell in love with that. And that's all I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to Ciara next. Obviously not your first role here, but still curious. <laughs> no, still, um, you know, much like Claire, when I was younger, I did not think that this was an actual career option. So when it was presented to me, I was like, no, right, let's see what happens. And just sort of <laughs> walked my way into it. Um, and now here I am probably 11 years later. It still feels fake. Like I was in the midst of filming a TV show and was applying to colleges because I was like, well, this isn't going to last very long. Um, almost went to SCAD actually. And then I was like, sort of woke up and was like, wait, this is, I'm doing what I love to do. Um, still to this day, it feels like some sort of incredible theater dream. Hmm. I'm just waiting to wake up. <laughs> Elle, what about you? Honestly, I started in church as a kid and, you know, just having fun and make believing in my regular life. And then um, when I was going to high school, there was a high school in Houston, Texas called the High School for the Performing Arts, which is like a fame school. And I was like, I'm going to apply there and I'm going to go for theater, just decided. And I thought I'd be a doctor, though. I was like, you know, or something. I don't know. And then I go and within the first semester, I was completely opened up to what theater really is. And I decided right then that I would do this for the rest of my life. And I've been trying to since that moment. <laughs> and here you are again. <laughs> uh, Joshua, we'll go to you next. Well, I, you know, bugged my mom to be an actor since I was probably three or four, since I could speak. Wow. And, you know, she never really wanted me to because she didn't want to be one of those moms who, like, pushed her kids too far. And she didn't want me to blame her later on in life. That's what I didn't want to do. But, you know, I'm an entertainer. And wherever I go, I'm always super energetic and happy, you know, kind of the life of the party. And, you know, the funny story is, 
the first job I got was off the football field when I finished the game and a cash director came up to me and they're like, you know, we want you in this project. Like, would you be open to it? And I looked at my mom. I was like, mom, it's finally time for you to let me, you know, be an actor. Like, come on. Like, and then she told me, she's like, I'll give you one year. If you whine and complain about anything, I'm taking you out. Simple as that. And, you know, six years later, we're, we're here now. Wow. That's a great story. <laughs> and uh, Joel, the last of the group for this answer. <laughs> I I mean I was such a theater kid growing up and I I still consider myself one and it started like in community theaters and theater camps like so many of us um here today on this panel and then I think it was I remember being in the eighth grade and we had um to write an essay about you know what we wanted to do in college like what we were thinking of doing in college and I literally wrote my essay about how I wanted to go to the University of Michigan and I wanted to study musical theater because I knew they had one of the best programs. And it was kind of just like, I didn't apply for any schools academically. I knew this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to study musical theater. And I went to the University of Michigan and then I moved to New York and started auditioning and here I am. But it was one of those things where I just, I knew early on, I was like, no, I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to do it or, you know, what it's going to take. But this is something I can't imagine myself not doing. Hmm. This is Entertainment Weekly and SCAD's Breaking Big panel. Uh, if you have any questions for us, you can drop them in the chat. We're going to try to get to a few before the end of this. Um, and we're talking about breaking in to the business. Uh, obviously, uh, each of you are here for sort of big breakout roles. Some of you have been already working a little bit longer than others, but I'm curious for the projects that you're here for, um, is, was there a moment making it or, or, or a scene that really just stuck out to you and said, this is something special. This is something different for me. Uh, let's go to Talia first on this one. In never rarely, sometimes no. always, you mean? <laughs> um, Honestly, I would say in the rehearsal process was when I mm. had a moment of like, wow, that like this film could really mean a lot to people. Eliza really focused on my relationship with Sydney and our personal relationship to the story and the topic rather than looking at it through like the eyes of our character. And I started to feel like the weight of the script and the weight of the issue and Eliza's passion through just kind of the rehearsal process and reading through the script and breaking it down that way. And Sydney and I ended up getting really close because it's kind of difficult not to get really close to somebody that you're that intimate with for that amount of time. Mm. And I I felt like our, our bond and kind of care for each other would transfer to the screen women and people will be able to relate and appreciate to them. Hmm. Claire, I'm curious for you, since you are also the writer of this project, what it was like seeing it come to life in that way. And if, if there was a moment like that. Um, I think actually weirdly it was when they asked me to call into the production office and I was like, a production office? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, I went down and I was like, there's a whole production office set up for this. <laughs> and then they had like all these, that. Uh, departments and then outside there was a big huge car park where they were starting to practice building the house because we built a house in my film and they were building sets and stuff and i remember being really aware that like oh my god there's a whole machine that's set up for months before you even <laughs> make the movie and i was like i'm really learning about that and um, as a writer <laughs> but i would say like as an actor I just think there was moments on set with my my fake children uh, when we were improvising and I just I knew like they were just so natural and authentic and I thought I just think they're going to be the real stars of this movie that's that's when I started to go oh my god it's really special because there it wasn't just about the script then it was about what we were capturing in the moment on the day and so I just knew then with Phila Lloyd leading us and nurturing that kind of thing happening in the moment i thought okay if anything i don't know if we have a you know a hit or anything like that but i just knew we were making something very authentic and that and that meant a lot to me hmm. al anything come to mind for you um yeah you know 
our set was very familial. Like we all got really close really quickly. Some of us already knew each other, but there was one day where a lot of us were on set and um, during lunch, we decided to go in my trailer. It was probably like eight of us women. And we went in my trailer and we all ate together. Some people were on the floor, some people were sitting on the couch and we just talked and all of the walls came down and we related and you know some of the people in there were celebrities but we related to one another and talked about our experiences and from that moment forth every time we were on set it was like i got you in the scene know that you can go as far as you want to go and i got you and i think that's part of the magic in the film so yeah that moment kind of brought it all together and solidified the chemistry that we all had hmm. uh, i'll go to joanna next I think my moment, it was not so much on set, but um, so on all, any time we had to, we were uh, filming a scene together, Ariana DeBose and I, my co-star, um, she plays Alyssa Green, my um, on-screen girlfriend. Uh, we would carpool to and from set every day together. And so we got to start our day um, just like talking about the world, talking about life, like jamming out to music on the freeways. It was also both of our, um, like we never had really spent a lot of time in LA before. And so we were both like, you know, getting to know the city together. And then like after um, our shoot day, we would get to just like decompress and debrief on our little carpool and it, it's just one of those moments. I mean, like, I should, like Ariana is someone who I've looked up to um, for so long because she's a theater icon and to become friends and to become confidants and just to trust each other and to enjoy just our quiet moments in the car together, building our friendship. It's, that's what's so special for me. Ciara, what about you? Uh, much like Talia, I feel like my moment came in the rehearsal process, the pre-production process. Um, you know, again, dealing with the epidemic, I wanted to, the opioid epidemic, I wanted to come out with some sensitivity. So I was lucky enough for a rehab clinic in Cleveland to open its doors to me, Stella Maris. They're spectacular and they let me come in and, and speak to some of their um, outpatients as well as their employees, many of whom have gone through the program themselves. And it was in that moment that I was sitting down and talking to these people that I was like, oh, this is bigger than anything I've ever done before. This means so much to so many people. Hmm. Did that kind of realization change the way you, you prepped or, or the way you thought about, about the role? Um, I wouldn't say that it changed much about the way that I thought, but it just changed the reality for me. Hmm. Um, you know, sitting in these scenes, sometimes when you're on a set, it's easier, it's easy to be like, swept away by all of the friendships and all of the inside jokes that you have with the cast and crew around you. But when you're dealing with something like this, it's, you know, coming back to those, those stories and those moments and those bits of like, how you felt, you know, how these people felt looking at themselves in the mirror or little ticks that they had, or it, it, it sort of, it, it definitely brought me back in a um, very serious way. Mm. And Joshua, last word for you, to you on this one. Um, kind of like Joel, it's my moment, my first moment, I should say, came, you know, I got to Virginia, I would say, about three or two weeks prior to filming. And so it was a lot of prep, you know, learning how to ride horses and, you know, learning yeah. the basic techniques on how to survive in the 1850s, I should say. And, you know, in those long van rides with all my castmates and those dinners, I kind of realized like, this is exactly where I want to be. You know? like, this is real. I mean, we all became a family in that moment of time. And it just, it, it helped my performance 10 times better to, you know, play along with people that actually know me and understand, you know, that this project's something bigger than ourselves. Mm. Well, let's get to some audience questions. Thanks to all who have submitted so far. Um, and I'll stick with you, Joshua, for this first one. Um, how do you get over the newbie feelings and inhibitions uh, when you're among, you know, big actors like Ethan Hawke and 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 so much, so much, you know, genius? I mean, I was lucky enough to have an to have an like you know a scene partner like Ethan because Ethan doesn't act like you know his his name like as he as he could act. He's just such a a humble and down to earth guy and 
he was so focused, I mean, primarily on me throughout the first two episodes because you want to make sure I was as comfortable as possible. But, you know, I think for yourself, if you want to kind of get over that newbie kind of new feeling, um, you know, just make sure you're receptive to learning and don't think you ever know anything because, I mean, even 10 years from now, if I, you know, when I continue acting, there's still a lot of stuff that I can learn any, any and every single day. And so I think the biggest thing is to be open to new things and to be open to learning. Hmm. Al, what about you when you would step into a room with Vanessa Williams, for example? Um, I, she was also very humble. Um, yeah. So she made it easy, but going into the process, I'm kind of weird in how I move about the cabin. I'm like really laser focused and like I have blinders on and I'm just in it. I pretty much lived in that role. I lived in the eighties. That was the only music I was listening to and only things on TV I was watching. Um, so every day I went to work, I was just ready to work and dive in. And then as soon as we were done, I was like, oh my God, that was Vanessa. And I kind of banned out to everybody and they were like, we know you. <laughs> so I, I saved those moments and I just delved deeper into the work as much as possible. And so those fears subsided really quickly for me. And Joellen, of course, <laughs> you have to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's advice that I would give is, I mean, they're people too. And to treat them with the same kind of kindness and curiosity that you would treat anyone on set and to ask them questions about their life and they'll ask you some about yours, but that they, uh, I mean, they're real humans and they are just as kind and as wonderful as you want them to be. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Our next question, I'll, I'll start with Ciara for this one. For fellow young actors, what is something you wish you knew uh, in your first year in the business? Something I wish that I knew. Um, not too similar to what um, Meryl <laughs> uh, I'm like, glad Meryl's wisdom is here for she, <laughs> um, You know, you do your homework, but when you come to set, don't let it weigh you down. Be open and responsive to what's going on, and most importantly, enjoy yourself. Don't let, don't put too much pressure on, you know, your performance or you as a person. Just mm -hmm. enjoy the experience. Mm. Uh, I'll open the floor on this one. Anyone else have anything that they wish they knew their first year? I would say that there is never any, ne never any shame in working multiple jobs while you are pursuing your career. Like you are no less of an artist because you are also working another job to pay the bills. Like literally up until I left to go shoot the prom, I was working three jobs, one of which was minimum wage, one was a dollar above minimum wage, and one was babysitting. And there, I never want people to feel like there's a stigma because you are paying your bills. You can still be an artist and also pay your bills. You are no less valid and your talent is no less worthy. Well said. Very well said. <laughs> Um, Claire, I'm curious for you, uh, the decision, I suppose, to write your own material. Um, is that something that was conscious for you? How did that develop? I originally was just writing the movie and think, trying to get a, get an actress attached to it because I didn't have any oh. in sway in film world at all at that point. Like I, I hadn't much experience. So I was more interested in just getting it made at first and I was trying to just be a screenwriter and um, because I was doing okay with some theater work, but um, obviously not earning that much money around. And I just thought long term, it might be nice to be a writer as well. And uh, I was just very lucky when Phyllis Deloitte and I were working together in theater and she asked me, she, she said she wanted to direct the film, uh, which was kind of like, what? <laughs> and it was amazing. Like, um, but it was actually her saying to the rest of the to the producers saying I'm not I don't really want to direct this without Claire playing the lead and we knew that was going to take a bit longer then to finance it and um, but that's how I that's how that came about so I wouldn't say I I was writing this at first thinking I was going to star in it if you know what I mean mm. but it, it it happened organically and I'm really glad because I'm I happen to be good casting for that role I mean if I was writing the role of a 55 year old and um, black 
man, I would obviously not be playing that right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just that I happen to be riding the role of somebody who was like 28 Irish and living in Dublin, that, that it suited. But, um, so, but I would say to anyone out there that is able to storytell in any shape or form um, beyond acting, I would say also use your spare time if you can to wonder on how you could do that. Um, Cause I think it's lovely just when, when you're an actor, sometimes you're, you are a little bit like you're dependent on the whole thing being up and running and then you might get the job. Um, but if you can look at yourself as not just an actor, but as an artist and a storyteller, it shifts something in your head. And, and I think you should open yourself up to what you could possibly do besides acting. Not saying that just acting isn't enough, by the way, but just it's nice to think of yourself as a storyteller. And, and that really helped me in, in my journey. Mm, absolutely. Uh, I feel like that leads, we might not get better advice uh, than we'll hear for this next question, which is, um, has anyone you've worked with given you advice about cultivating the longevity of your career? Obviously, <laughs> Claire, I feel like just gave pretty good advice yourself, but um, anybody else? Um, um, when during, oh, sorry, go, uh, for it. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. First and then go. Um, the first week of shooting, we were doing the home scenes and Blair Underwood plays my uncle, uh, my father figure. And we were shooting in South Central and we would do lunch, like, you know, out on the lawn in people's homes. Um, so a lot of people in the neighborhood would come out, which was amazing. If I was a kid and they were shooting a movie next door, I would also come out and try to hang out. But he was really good about teaching me to preserve my energy. And he was like, you know, it's great to give and it's great to socialize with crew and everyone else but you have seven more weeks to carry a movie and there's so much pressure and weight and energy that you have to give of yourself. And in doing so, you have to, it's brilliant at least to take time for yourself to refocus and center yourself. So literally every day, I took that moment to just recenter myself and bring myself back to a place where I could go and give of myself. Because if there's nothing left in my tank, not only can I not offer anything, but I can't offered to the world either. So I took that and I still use it. Mm. Mm. Joshua, to you next. Well, you know, on the set of The Good Lord Bird, I worked with a lot of veteran actors, you know, David Moores, um, Victor Williams, Orlando Jones, all those type of guys. And especially Ethan Hawke, you know, they all gave me great advice on how to, you know, have the most fulfilling and I think, you know, promising career. And I think one of the biggest things that Ethan said to me would be, you know, never lose, like once you lose the love of acting, don't act anymore because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you should never act for the fame or act for the money or act for anything besides the pure love of your craft. And he says that will take you to when you're six years old and you still want to act. And I cherish that because, you know, acting is, you know, like, like my, like my baby, I should say, I don't have a baby, but like a baby. To me. And, yeah. you know, I just want to perfect my craft and keep working until I can't work no more. <laughs> uh, our next question is for Talia. Um, how has never rarely, sometimes always changed your attitudes um, towards the issue, issues it presents? Did you, what, what, anything you learned particularly? Um, well, going into the project, I was very, passionate already about um, people's reproductive rights and passionate about hopefully changing how people's reproductive rights are in our country. But being a part of the film, I actually learned a lot more about it. I didn't act, I didn't realize the, the entire weight behind the issue and really how difficult it can be for people to receive health care in our country. I live in New York state where the laws are set up in favor of women's bodies, but in a place like Pennsylvania where Skyler and um, Autumn were from, being under the age of 18, you're kind of stuck yeah. in wanting to receive health care. So just getting to learn about that and go to Pennsylvania and see what that was like and what that process kind of looked like firsthand, I definitely became even more passionate about the topic. Yeah. Ciara, I'm interested in, in your thoughts on that uh, for Cherry and the issues it presents. And also our, our next question for you is um, what about the subject matter initially drew you to, to wanting to make that film? Um, 
I'll start with the second yeah. question first. Initially, what drew me to the film was the fact that it was, you know, I read the script and it was dealing with such extraordinarily heavy topics, but it was still one of the funniest things that I have ever read. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's what I learned also growing up in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, <laughs> being from the Midwest, which unfortunately has been absolutely ripped apart by the opioid epidemic. You know, I think unfortunately almost everyone had, knows someone or they themselves has, have experienced it in, in some way, shape or form. And I think the way that it's shaped us as the people is it's taught us how to laugh in the face of tragedy to stay alive, but still understanding the weight of the situation and, and, and how important um, advocating for these people are. Um, you know, it, it would be a dream to live in a world where we treat our addicts with the care and respect that every human deserves. It's hmm. a great answer. Our next question is for Joellen. Um, was it difficult to perform a role um, in a show that's you know very theatrical, made for the stage, on a film set? What was that transition uh, like for you? Uh, I think it's a testament to the brilliance of our writers, um, Matt Sklar, Chad Begulin, and Bob Martin, that their work was able to translate so well from stage to film. Um, and I actually, I was fortunate enough that I was, uh, was able to see the prom on Broadway before I even knew about the movie, um, adaptation. And I just loved the performances, loved the story. And as far as how is cha like changing the acting style, I feel like, you know, we, at least in school, you know, you think of like, oh, there's stage acting and there's, you know, film acting, but really I just tried to focus on the listening and giving it your scene partner, the energy and focus. And that is the same, whether it's on stage or on screen. And yeah, it was, it's truly a testament to how well this story is crafted by our writers. Hmm. Uh, I wanted to, to close by asking each of you um, about your inspirations, whether it's an actor or a film. Uh, a couple of you have mentioned, you know, projects like Cherry and Bad Hair, especially really balancing different kinds of tones in The Good Lord Bird. Um, they're very ambitious and I think very modern projects. Um, what are some of your inspirations uh, coming up? Let's uh, start with Claire for this one. And um, inspiration, sorry, I didn't really get the question now. <laughs> the, the person that kind of inspired us at the start of our career. Yeah, and an actor who's been a big inspiration for you or a film, like just as a creative. Um, I would say uh, possibly, well, actually, I did really love Meryl Streep when I was younger. Hmm. Um, and then the first book I ever read about acting was a book called In, In Other People's Shoes. And it was actually by Harriet Walter who then ended up in my film like <laughs> years later but she wrote this film this book that was uh sorry about being an actor but it was literally just about being an actor and how that has an effect on the world and how storytelling actually affects society and i just never had anyone show me that it was a a job that's almost like you're almost like a civil servant to the world and it's so important and i, I just never understood kind of what it actually was until I read that book. And I'd say that had a huge influence on me and made mm. me see it as less of a fairy tale job. It made it very real. Mm. Joshua, what about you? Well, the two people I would say that are like my biggest inspirations when it comes to acting, one being Denzel Washington, I absolutely love all his work. And then one being the late Chadwick Boseman, may he rest in mm. peace. Um, you know, he was a big inspiration for me just like a lot of the power that came with his roles and you know especially being a young african-american you know kind of me just wanting to carry on you know kind of him passing the torch and i want to carry on you know what he was doing for the entire world and all the awareness that he was bringing in i mean he was a great guy and i hope that you know when i get older i can be someone even close to him hmm. uh talia what about you um, I would say for me, it was a film seeing um, Little Miss Sunshine. And like you were saying earlier, mm. seeing the, the different tones that were presented in that movie really just 
inspired me and sparked a lot of questions and a new passion for film. And after seeing that, it was a couple years ago, I was like, wow, I really want to tell stories like that and make people laugh and cry all at the same time. Hmm. Uh, Sierra? I would say um, for me, it's the other actors around me and, and watching all the beautiful art that gets made every year. That's what constantly excites me to be a part of this career, especially other young actors who are on a similar path to me. Um, watching what they accomplish and what they're capable of doing is like, it constantly amazes me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what makes me so excited too to do what I do. Nice. Joellen? For me, um, a transformational uh, piece of art is Fun Home, um, the musical oh. uh, <laughs> um, originally based on the graphic novel by Alison Bechtel, uh, written by Lisa Cronin and Janine Story, but it's just a testament to the transformational power of queer storytelling within the musical theater genre. And it is the kind of art and the level of storytelling that I aspire to every day. Love that. And I'll give the last word to Elle. Um, people wise, I'll start off with Meryl Streep, of course. <laughs> Looming large today. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's here with us. Um, Sydney Poitier, Tandy Newton, uh, Claire Blanchett, like people like that have inspired me by transforming themselves and becoming new characters I see on screen all the time. Um, but I believe that artistry is a gift to the world, much like Claire was saying, and it's up to artists to be the truth tellers and to remind the world of what it has been and what it can be. And I find that to, like it's an honor to be a part of a world in an artistry where I get to do that. Um, and we get to influence people and their minds and drop seeds and let people know that they can be anything. And like, it's like wearing a cape, so yeah. That's what inspires me all the time. That's a pretty perfect note to end on, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much to Joe Allen Pullman, Claire Dunn, Sierra Bravo, El Lorraine, Joshua Caleb Johnson, and Talia Ryder. Uh, the films herself with Claire, the Good Lord Bird series with Joshua, and Bad Hair with Elle screened at the festival. Uh, thank you all so much for being here, and congratulations on your very well-deserved Breaking Big Awards. I'm David Canfield with Entertainment Weekly. Uh, and thanks for watching and asking questions today. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.